right, it's five o'clock. I'm going to call the uh, September 22nd meeting of the El Segundo Unified School District Board of Education to order. And our student representative, Benjamin Villa, is going to lead us in the pledge. Ready to begin. I pledge allegiance Thanks. to the flag of the United States, the States of America. And to the republic for which it stands, stands. nation, Please. under God, God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Can you be seated? Thank you, Benny. In uh, closed session, the board approved the following student matters. Student matter number one, student number 18570, with a vote of 5-0. Moving on in our agenda, we do have a number of public comments. Um, <clears throat> we had 25 comments from the public in regards to the Herald ad that was placed last week. And uh, because there are so many, I, I will not read all of these as has been our practice. I will read the names of those who've submitted comments and they will be placed on our um, board agenda web page following this meeting. So we have comments submitted from Megan Langos, Paul Lanel, uh, Lanny, Jimmy Russ, Joel Foster, Joey Russ, Julia Clark, Zach Edwards, Marley Armstrong, Pam Sullivan, Mariah Cooley, Kenneth Shelton, Leslie O'Connor, Adam Ansari, Shannon Whitener, Christine Carpenter, Chris Chun, Eric and Tracy Kirsten, Sean Matlos, Kim Indelicato, Melissa McCaverty, Lisa Matlos, Laura Nielsen, Michelle Leach, Crystal de St. Eigen, and Michelle Keldorf. Uh, if your comments were not submitted by the deadline of 1230, um, your name wouldn't be read, but we will definitely include them in our public comments for the October meeting. In addition, we have uh, two comments submitted in response to the joint communication letter that was dated September 21st, 2020. The first one is from Martin Elam. While I appreciate the board for sending a letter to parents and students, which I can only assume is in response to the hateful and divisive editorial on page seven, of the September 17th, 2020 publication of the El Segundo Herald, I am terribly disturbed at the failure of the board to speak truth to power and call out racism for what it is. These types of weak letters are not helpful and do very little to bridge the divide or bring about much needed change. We need strength and courage from our board members. The board's letter appears to be an attempt to justify to the racists why the board posted helpful information on their website instead of calling out the racists to stop bullying and spreading hate. The last line of that editorial posted on page seven of the El Segundo Herald says, said it all, please join our fight to reclaim our schools. That is classic racist dog whistling. We all know what was meant and intended by those words. Translated, let's get these N-words out of our schools. I expect better from the ESUSD board and the ESUSD administration. How is my daughter, a beautiful, intelligent black teenager, supposed to stand up to bullies when the adults on the ESUSD board won't? The second comment is from Tanya Nodar. My name is Tanya Nodar and I am the president of the El Segundo Teacher Association. I wanted to share my appreciation to the board and our superintendent for the joint communication that went public yesterday, September 21st. 
It prides me to know that our board, our leaders, and our team of educators are united in the mission to support all the students who attend El Segundo schools. We at ESTA concur with the content of your communication and with the goals outlined in the graduate profile. We believe that it clearly and eloquently communicated the values requisite to educating the whole student. What is essential to an effective and meaningful learning community is providing an environment for all students and staff that is safe and inclusive. We stand firmly with you and look forward to engaging in constructive dialogue that furthers this mission. Thank you again for the clear and thoughtful message that we are indeed in this together. Tanya Nodar. I guess, uh, actually, I do have one more <laughs> comment from Sean uh, Matlos. This was brilliant. Be well. Uh, I do have another comment regarding uh, item 6B on our action agenda. So I will read that when that item comes up. Next, we're going to move on to um, special presentations, and we'll start with our student representative report. Benjamin Villa. Thank you. Uh, to begin, on Friday the 18th, we had our first spirit day of the year. We had students wear blue and gold to their classes. Certain teachers provided incentive to increase spirit um, participation. Then the students who had the best blue and gold would send in their pictures to the high school account. Then we had students vote on who was the most spirited to have a competition. Um, in honor of Suicide Prevention Month, we are providing helpful tips and sources on the high school Instagram page, such as different ways to cope with different smarts and links to a virtual suicide prevention summit. Um, we also showed our first episode of Bird's Eye View to the student body. Our first weekly video announcement will premiere tomorrow and will continue on the remainder of the virtual school year. Um, we have a senior mock election on October 6th involving all uh, seniors and the entire counseling department won our Teacher of the Month Award. Um, AVID virtual tu uh, tutoring started this past week, and we also wanted to acknowledge the um, response you guys uh, made to the We the Parents um, editorial. Um, we know we appreciate uh, what you guys posted. We know, I, I, though I don't speak for the entire student body, a large, uh, many students, um, yes, they did appreciate, but they do still see changes that need to be made. Um, we appreciate, um, we know we want what's best for the community. We want equity. We want diverse uh, material that remains neutral and just gives us the information that we can provide it for ourselves. Um, certain groups such as uh, Students for Change are also fighting for this um, equal rights or equal representation. And yeah. Thank you, Ben. We appreciate hearing from the students' point of view. Thank you. Uh, our next presentation um, on the Measure ES bond uh, will be delayed. Uh, our consultant uh, cannot join us until about 5.30, so we're going to move on to presentation on the return of limited specialized support services on campus. Uh, Dr. Moore? Yes, it's with a great deal of pleasure. I call upon Dr. Jack Plotkin, our Director of Innovation and Student Support, and Mr. Ali Rabihi, our Director of Maintenance and Operations, to share with the board um, our return plan for limited specialized support services on campus. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you, Dr. Moore. And uh, good evening, Dr. Nishime, members of the board. Uh, Benny, nice to see you. Uh, Mr. Rabi, Mr. Rabihi and I are gonna talk to you tonight about the return of, potential return of limited specialized support services on campus. And um, this is really specific to students with special needs and students in special education. The reason we bring this to you is, you know, a shift to remote learning has worked for some students and it's been quite a challenge for many others. And we see that some of our students with special needs and especially those who are most highly impacted um, are the ones who also have the most difficulty accessing and benefiting from distance learning. There's just some nuances that are lost um, when there's not physical proximity of the adult and the experienced special educators. So we're gonna talk about um, potential return of one-on-one -on -one assessments and as well as return of some uh, limited specialized in-person services. And that is uh, based on a LA County public health order uh, that permits us to do so. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. V.E. to kind of uh, talk through a little bit more of that health order. 
Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Pluckham. Appreciate that. Um, members of the board, Dr. Moore, cabinet, um, the LA County Department of Public Health uh, back in midsummer uh, put out uh, the protocol, the LA County protocol, the health officer order uh, for the safe reopening of schools for K-12 schools. And of course, we've seen uh, a lot of changes and evolution since then. Uh, right now, uh, we are presently working with the state's framework for recovery, which is contingent on uh, how each county is doing with respect to uh, COVID-19 rates and positivity. And so Mr. currently Gannon, the I'm county- sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. B. Mr. Gannon, could you give us the next slide? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gannon. Uh, right now, currently we're at tier one uh, with the state's framework for recovery. Uh, however, uh, the Los Angeles County uh, Department of Public Health has allowed for a limited reopening uh, for students to physically come onto campus um, for uh, specialized uh, services. And uh, the effective date of that is actually uh, September the 14th. Now, what does this exactly mean? Uh, the key phrase is small cohorts. Uh, it's very critical that this um, protocol with small cohorts be followed. Uh, what that entails is uh, no more than 12 students or youth uh, in a cohort with no more than two supervising adults. Uh, they clearly state that the intermingling or cross-contamination of cohorts is completely not permissible. Uh, so students must remain in their cohorts at all times. Now, we also do have adult aides that provide services uh, to students. Those adult aides may be counted uh, towards, will be counted towards the cohort. They don't have to be counted towards the two supervising adults, but they will be counted towards the actual cohort number. There is also the other critical feature, which is uh, the total population of all these cohorts put together can be no more than 10% of the total school enrollment at that given point uh, in time. And again, the strong focus on no uh, intermingling or cross-contamination of students' cohorts is mentioned uh, time and time again throughout the protocol. And this applies, again, to specialized services. Specifically, we're talking about students with special needs, students with IEPs, and English language learners. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So, as I mentioned, there's really two categories. So there's assessments and there's services. Assessments are required in special education. If there's a student who is suspected of having a disability, we must conduct an assessment. And for that assessment to be valid and reliable, that assessment um, has to happen in person. We've been able to conduct some parts of assessments remotely, some parent interviews, um, so, some pieces that we can that way, some rating scales, but we really uh, have a, a lot of assessments on hold right now because we cannot do the in-person piece. And so because assessments are conducted one-on-one, -on -one, it's a smaller environment, there's a, a, a fewer variables really involved in this. This is what we are proposing focusing on first, um, bringing back uh, our specialists and uh, students abiding by the order to, to provide these one-on-one -on -one assessments. You may also see there in the second bullet is that includes our English learners. So there's the English uh, language proficiency assessment and so uh, we would also be proposing finding a safe way to bring them back to assess our English learners. Uh, next slide, please. So that's assessments. The, the bigger category and the one that's much more complex and with a lot of variables um, is providing the services. And the first step would really be to determine which students are the ones who would come back uh, to receive these limited services. In the few districts around the state and uh, one locally who's started this, they've looked at the students who are um, considered most impacted. Uh, those are students who may spend uh, up to half their day, maybe even more in specialized academic settings. So in like a special education classroom, as those students are typically the ones um, who are least benefiting from the remote learning. So that would be an example. But we need to identify who, who would come back and then create uh, what would that look like in terms of the cohorts so we can abide by the health order and the numbers that uh, Mr. Rabi e, uh, had mentioned in the health order. Next slide, please. 
And in terms of what those services look like, they could be anything that's in the bullets here. So we talked about assessments, specialized academic instruction. That means um, instruction provided by a special education teacher in a small co small cohort. But there, we're also talking about um, related services. So that could be speech and language services. That could be counseling that's provided by a uh, school psychologist, occupational therapy, physical therapy, adapted PE. Those are some of the potential services that could be provided uh, in person if a student is not benefiting from them remotely. Uh, next slide, please. And so, uh, Mr. B, this is back to you. You know, our, our number one concern, obviously, is the health of our students and the safety and well-being of our students and the safety and well-being of our staff. Um, we have to make sure those are in place. I mean, that's why we're not in school right now, right? Um, but we have this public health order that has identified that there are safe ways to do this. And so, you know, now we want to figure out how can we get our students to really benefit from this. And I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Review, to talk about some of those considerations and the immense amount of planning that you and your team have done. Sure thing, Dr. Plotkin. Um, first off, um, the, the health order has a specific definition of what the term supervising adult means in this situation. Uh, we need to note that per the health order, it states a supervising adult does not physically interact with any other cohort. That's the number one thing we, of course, will be keeping in mind as we plan and, and move forward with this. The other aspect with regard to the health and safety is if and when we decide to move forward with limited specialized services, uh, we must inform the LA County Department of Public Health. There's a, there's a procedure for that. And the notification is done per school site. And uh, the other thing that's also important that's mentioned throughout the health order with regard to limited specialized services is at least 50% of the day uh, needs to be spent in outdoor space. Um, more and more research has shown that COVID-19 the, preval the prevalence of it, the propensity for its spread is limited with uh, effective um, air quality and ventilation and of course, outdoor space use. And we have of course been working with that uh, for the past several months. But as Dr. Plotkin mentioned, once again, uh, health and safety is of the utmost importance uh, whenever we are considering the, uh, bringing students back onto campuses physically. We of course applied that with the soft and eventual opening of TLC, and the same will be applied in this situation. So again, number one focus is the effective use of these small cohorts. There is specific cohort guidance that also the State Department of Public Health has provided uh, that we'll be following, but the health order protocol at the county level uh, supersedes everything else, and so we'll be following that. Uh, we have, as was mentioned in a number of uh, board meetings prior, and as well as in our town halls, uh, months ago, we have secured uh, sufficient, more than a sufficient personal protective equipment for both our staff and our students, uh, not just with cloth face coverings, but with face shields, face drapes, gowns, gloves. Um, the other important thing is, of course, the physical distancing or social distancing that we have heard about. And we have signage uh, at all of our campuses. There's more signage that we can definitely place to remind students and staff uh, to physically distance and, of course, to wear their face coverings. Healthy hygiene is the other critical uh, component. And by healthy hygiene, we're referring to hand washing, the emphasis of constant hand washing, and also the proper instructions to be used when hand washing, that 20 second rule, uh, if you will. And of course, we have brought on uh, portable hand washing stations that are touch free, that are foot operated, uh, that students will be able to use. Working with our site administrators, maintenance and operations has devised a district-wide cleaning and disinfecting protocol that all custodians utilize. So a custodian at Center Street has the same protocol in place as a custodian at the El Segundo Middle School. So disinfecting and cleaning is very important along with the appropriate equipment and materials. And lastly, an exposure management plan. The health order does provide for a exposure management or infection control plan. We have reviewed that plan with site administrators. Uh, there's a lot more practice that needs to be done with that plan, but that plan is in place should there be a laboratory verified case of COVID-19, whether it's among the stu students or staff, and what will our procedures be when that is actually verified. And again, as I mentioned, the use of outdoor space, we have secured two tents, one at center, one at middle school, and we've got more than a dozen in route from the vendor that we'll be establishing uh, throughout our campuses 
to provide for that effective outdoor space instruction and supervision. Next slide, please. The decision to return to, to physically to return students to school, that is a local decision. Uh, the lo a local decision coupled with the strict of the county health order. As I mentioned in the previous discussion, the county health order supersedes the guidance that we have seen. The county health order, health order has taken in summary all the guidance that we have heard of since March 16, 2020. The guidance from the CDC, from the CDE, from the CDPH, and also from our governor and other agencies, both local and at the state level. And so it is our decision as a local school district to move forward with providing specialized services in small cohorts to our students following these three in summary bullet points, uh, no more than 12 students and two supervising adults, a maximum of 10% of your total student population at a school site, and following those strict cohorting, cohorting guidelines and pre prevention of any cohort cross-contamination or intermingling. Next slide, please. Thanks, uh, Mr. B. So members of the board, you do have an action item tonight um, to authorize uh, some assessment and limited services. So I want, I want to let you know that we have, this isn't something that we're doing on a whim. We, we keep our eyes on the health order um, with eagle eyes. And as soon as we get it, we start thinking about how can we plan to do this uh, safely and effectively and make it work for kids so they can benefit. So these are some of the key objectives really that we've been looking at. Um, and so, you know, the first step would be to get the board approval to do so. Um, the second step, which we've, we've already begun is establishing a think tank of uh, safe holders to plan for this. So. These are our special education specialists who know our kids, who love our kids, who know what they need. So Mr. B and I can say, sure, here's a tent, uh, <laughs> teach your kids out there. They're the ones who know like, no, this, this tent's not gonna work, my kid runs, we need, to be, we need to be inside. So we've already established this team who are thinking about how can we do this? What do we need? Um, how can we leverage these safety measures? What additional things do we need so that um, not only our, stu our students are safe, so that our staff are safe? Um, so with that think, after that think take, then it's really starting to communicate the plan with the staff for these assessments, starting the date to begin the assessments, evaluating how that's working. Um, if our assessments are working well, and uh, it seems like we've, we've got some procedures down, then we start um, with the planning of the timeline for in-person services um, and the cohorting that Mr. Ruby uh, described and how that's gonna work, continually evaluating how to provide services, how to make sure it's safe uh, for everyone can, communicating that with the families and then beginning to provide those services. So those are kind of our steps that we hope to uh, follow uh, if the board authorizes us to allow for in-person assessments and uh, some limited services. And we do strongly believe that uh, we just have some kids that really need that in-person I mean, you know, they're some of our kids who are most impacted, like I said, are the ones who need it the most. So we thank you for your consideration this evening. And I thank uh, my colleague and friend, Mr. B.E. for all of his preparation in the health and safety. Thank you. So at this time, board, we'd be happy to answer any questions you might have on this topic uh, prior to bringing this action item before you. Nancy Kopp. Did I get unmuted? Okay. Okay. Um, well, I'd really like to see the kids with the highest be able to return to campus, but I had a couple of questions. Um, usually we start services with children when they're three years old or as soon as they're identified. Are we going to be able to offer services for children that young at this time? Yes. So we are currently offering services shortly. But uh, those would those would be students that we would also be considering offering uh, preschool special education uh, services for in person. That's what our our think tank and planning team would be evaluating. Okay, and I'm I'm also aware that we've done everything that we could do to mainstream a lot of these children. So now in this new model, they will have to be at least for the time being separated as they come back, which will be another major change. Okay, uh, 
I, I think that's all that I had. I just wondered too if you you're probably not this far along, but do you have any idea what age group you would try to bring back first or I'm not sure. Um, Dr. Moore, do, do you have a comment on that? No, um, this would be for anyone three through um, up through high school, um, but it would be our most moderate to severe students. Um, so it's a very specific uh, group of kids. Do we have any idea how many children we're talking about? Well, uh, it would be the number that we can safely educate following the health order and the ratio of the, the, 12, mm -hmm. the number of educators that we have. Thank you. Right. Uh, Paulette? Um, how long do you think uh, it will be before you get through that list of items and we'll be seeing kids on campus? <laughs> I, I wish, um, I can't say, um, uh, Ms. Cogdell, I, I appreciate the question. I, I hope as soon as possible. Um, there are just a lot of, of variables that do need to be worked out. Um, so uh, hopefully very soon, um, but we need to make sure that we have every single thing in place so that we have thought through everything and it's effective and safe for our students and staff. Um, a month? Paulette, did you have that? Kind of well, area? because, you know, a month, two months, Three months? I mean, wow. Yeah. Um, well, like I said, I, I I can't I can give you my best like a crystal ball of how long that these these things take. I mean, I could throw out there that hopefully by um, early October, maybe we're starting assessments, and maybe two to three weeks after that, we're starting services. But that's my best guess um, because we could we could be sailing and something could happen, it could be goes uh, smooth, more smoothly and or we could hit some major hurdles and have some um, s specific hurdles and uh, equipment or services or personnel that we need to get that could um, slow it down. But I, I, that, I can tell you that is my best guess. I understand that and I appreciate that because you, you got me all excited and <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> but no, that, I appreciate that. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Member Member Caudell, if I could piggyback on what Plotkin was sharing. So on, on the health and safety side, uh, what needs to be in place, uh, it, th there's a number of items. You know, we already have a lot of things in place, but with regard to specialized services, we've been working very closely with our site administrators on what's known as the paths of travel. Uh, we have to know exactly what those are so that there is, of course, none of that intermingling or cross-contamination. Then we also have to identify effectively all those classroom locations that will be utilized for those specialized services and making sure that the proper square footage is in there and the right part partitions and the needs guards are also in there. And the other thing that needs to be mentioned is the training. Uh, this is an era in which everybody cleans and disinfects and uh, our teachers need to know the chemicals that we use, how to apply them uh, appropriately and effectively. So there's a, there are those items on the health and safety side that need to be implemented. And I know Dr. Plotkin will take care of the instructional piece, but you know, m &O will help out with the health and safety piece. Okay. Yeah, and okay. I would just, I, just one more thing. Um, Ali, oh no, you can't. <laughs> A month, two months. <laughs> Again, you got me scared now. A month, two months. Well, it's it's uh, never uh, good to like just go ahead and apply a timeline because there are unforeseen circumstances and variables that come into play. Keep one thing in mind, board uh, member Caudell and everybody. This whole phenomenon has been evolutionary. Look at how much has changed. You know, we've gone from the era of guidances from local and state and federal leaders to this thing called the, uh, the the California Safe Economy Reopening Plan. We have the health order. There's constant changes, so we don't want to actually give an actual timeline right now, but all we do want to state is that we're going to follow the order. We're going to follow it to the T and make sure that both the kids and the staff are safe when they return physically to campus. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Moore and then uh, Tracy Miller's article. Yes, just one other point of clarification for the board. Um, it's important to note that all of our special education case carriers 
also have kids who are distance learning. So not every child who is identified special education will be returning. So you could have kids that are moderate to severe on your caseload that will need to come back, but you could also have other children that you're servicing. And so logistically, we have to look at, okay, who needs service at what time? When would the moderate to severe students return to campus? What, who are the special education aides who are assigned to that? Because then we have to reassign people. So there are a lot of logistics because we are not just serving one population, but two. So we have to be very cognizant of the um, logistics in relation to our um, staff. That sort of that leads to my question more about logistics is are we are you considering um, grouping students like by by age or by need? Um, just wondering if you know Center Street and Richmond students might be together or what the logic is between you know needs versus space that we have available and and how you would group them. Yeah, I would say the biggest uh, criteria would be how much are they benefiting from their education? Age is tough because you could have an 18 year old student who um, is in special education who's developmentally at a you know, five or six year old level. So um, I don't think that's a, a singular criteria to go by. So I think we'd look at um, who is who is really needing this and able to come back. And it could be, yes, depending on those numbers that um, schools, uh, you know, we have to group kids a little bit differently. Um, but that's something that our, all, our team is going to be working out in the, in the group I mentioned. Right. There are no further uh, questions or discussion, then we're going to move on to our next presentation. Uh, I see Tim Carty's here. Dr. Moore. Yes, it's with a great deal of pleasure. I introduce Tim Carty our uh, financial advisor from Piper Sandler, who has good news to share with the board. Welcome, Tim. Good to see you. Madam President and members of the board, it's nice to see all of you, even from afar. Um, so uh, last month, we had a very exciting day and a very successful sale of our second series of bonds, what we call Series B under measure ES. And you may remember when we completed the Series A bonds, as I shared with you, there's a provision in the law that requires that when a school district completes a bond sale, we do a report back to the board to share with you a few of the particulars, a few of the cost items. So I have a handful of slides that I think will put a bow on what was a very successful uh, endeavor and sale of our Series B bonds. So if you look at the cover, we had a $33 million sale of Measure ES Series B bonds. So let's look at the first slide. I always like to show the, the squiggly line here, which I think just highlights the fact that if you look at the lower right-hand corner, from a historical perspective, we sold our bonds at a historically low interest rate environment. Um, and I would give credit to the board and credit to Melissa and Kim for moving to really get this into the market in August. I mean, there may be chaos after the presidential election, we just don't know. And I think getting in and out prior to the politics really heating up was a, a good thing for the district. And as you can see, uh, the taxpayers are really going to benefit from us uh, selling our bonds during a historically low uh, interest rate time period. So that's slide number one. But there's a second reason why this bond sale was extremely successful if we look at the next slide. Not just low interest rates, but the work that Melissa and Kim and your team have done maintaining these very high El Segundo Unified credit ratings. So we have what's called a double A two rating from Moody's and a double A minus rating from Standard & Poor's. Those are very high ratings. And a lot of work went into this. We did a couple of prep sessions via Zoom with Kim and Melissa. We prepared an extensive briefing booklet and we had Zoom sessions with Moody's and Standard & Poor's. 
where I just want to give a lot of credit to Melissa and Kim. They are outstanding spokespeople and representatives of El Segundo Unified School District. And this was the result. And as you see at the bottom of the page, I tried to pull out some of the highlights of the rating reports. And you see, for example, Standard & Poor's Good District Financial Management Policies and Practices. You see under the Moody's, the top item, strong financial performance of the district. So just compliments uh, all around that even in spite of COVID, even in spite of the uncertainty with state funding for schools, we were able to maintain our very high credit rating. So timing, low interest rates, plus high credit ratings really helped deliver what you're going to see on the next couple of pages. So if we look at page three, um, remember we issued $33 million worth of bonds. So if you see on the left-hand side of the page, the net to the district for projects, a little over $32.4 million. The goal to maintain about a $48 per $100,000 tax rate. Remember that's lower than the $60, which is allowed. Um, as you're gonna see in a minute, number two, for 30 year money, fixed interest rate, we were able to tie down 2.11%, which is just astonishing. And then if you look at the right-hand side of the page, this is the repayment schedule for the Series B bonds. And the key thing to remember is, when you add the Series A bonds that we already issued, plus these bonds, plus the Series C bonds that we hope to issue next year, that repayment schedule should fit into a $48 projected tax rate for the community. So that repayment schedule, as you can see, it goes up and it goes down a little bit, even though it's fixed interest rate, but that's to fit it in with the Series A bonds that have come before and the Series C bonds that hopefully are gonna come next year. So if we look at the next slide, there's always a little bit of drama when we have these competitive sales of bonds, and, and Melissa and Kim have been through this before, <laughs> where we you know, get the bids at 9.30 or so in the morning, and at 9.29, we haven't had any bids yet, but they all come in like lightning at the last minute. And we had six bids from financial institutions from around the country. And you see some well-known household name firms there, Wells Fargo. Citigroup, Fidelity. Uh, you see a Wall Street giant like Morgan Stanley. And then you see a couple of firms you might not be familiar with, Robert Baird, and then the ultimate winner, Mesro Financial. And that's because they're boutique firms, they're specialty firms, and they only deal with government bonds. They don't advertise on television, they don't have branch offices, but they're very active when it comes to school bonds. One of the interesting things here, if you look at numbers two through six, they're bunched very close together. But Mesro Financial was the winner by a wide margin. They really wanted our bonds. They were very hungry to be in the market that day. They're based in Chicago. And so that 2.11% was a sign that that particular day, uh, they really wanted our bonds and they were the winning bidder. Just a couple of more slides. Um, the next one is just a little bit of the money in and the money out. So we issued $33 million worth of bonds. And then if you look under uses, measure ES project fund deposit, that's the net minus about $562,000 in transaction costs. Now you see this line item premium received from investors. So the investors paid a little more than 100 cents on the dollar for the bonds. They paid what's called a premium of about $2.7 million. That's the taxpayer's money. That goes into an account at Los Angeles County, and that's under uses that second line item. That's a credit for taxpayers. So we, the district, don't get that money. It just goes as a credit to the taxpayers. So what we get for projects is the 33 million minus the 562, or the 32 million 437. And the concluding slide is what were those transaction costs, the 562? So by far the biggest component 
is the compensation to the bond underwriter, Mesero Financial. Then you have uh, the legal counsel, bond and disclosure, you know, David Kaznoka. You have our firm, you have Moody's, you have Standard & Poor's. Then you have a lot of smaller items, uh, just miscellaneous costs that go into a bond sale. But uh, on the whole, again, I thought this was, first of all, a lot of fun. It's always a pleasure to work with Melissa and Kim and you, the board. And uh, I don't think we could have possibly asked for a better outcome. Um, the next activity will be, uh, I think at some point, probably early in 2021, Melissa will do a little update to the board on assessed valuations and those kinds of things. And then sometime next year, hopefully tap into our final series of bonds under Measure ES, so you can continue with all the wonderful projects which you're doing. So I'll stop there uh, in case there are questions or Melissa or Kim, if there's anything additional that I can add to be helpful, but thank you for letting me be a part of your meeting uh, here this evening. Any comments or questions? I thought it was exciting to be part of that bond sale. What went so quickly once it opened? It was it was uh, quite an experience. Right. Yeah. The leads come in like boom, 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 mm -hmm. and then uh, we tally it up. We proofread. You know, we we val validate the numbers and report the results. So yeah, I'm glad you were able to participate. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Right. If there's no comments, then um, thank you so much, Tim. Really appreciate the update. My pleasure. Have a wonderful rest of the meeting, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Okay. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye. Uh, we'll move on to our consent agenda items. We have items A through H on our consent agenda. So if uh, somebody would move and second. Okay. It's been moved by Paulette Caudell and seconded by Tracy Miller Zarnicki. Any discussion on our consent agenda? <laughs> All right, then I'll call for roll call vote. Um, Benny, your advisory vote? Aye. Tracy? Aye. Aye. Emily? Aye. Sorry, my <laughs> cursor was way off to the right. <laughs> Nancy? Aye. Paulette? No cursor. Aye. <laughs> Aye for me. 5 0 to approve the consent agenda. Uh, next, we'll move on to our action items. First item is acceptance of gifts. Uh, Emily, if you could read those. Yep. Uh, in accordance with the Board of Education Policy number 3290, the board may accept gifts as long as there is no conflict with education code. Uh, we have one gift from South Bay Classic Inc. for $5,000 to be utilized at the South Bay Families Connected um, and seeing no uh, conflict of interest, I move approval. And seconded by Tracy Miller Zarnicki. All right, um, if there's no discussion, then a roll call vote. Benny, your advisory vote. Aye. Thank you. And uh, Tracy? Aye. Emily? Aye. Nancy? Aye. Let. Aye. Okay. I vote aye. So five zero to accept our gifts. Item B is approval to offer limited specialized support services on campus. We just heard uh, Dr. Plotkin and Mr. Rabihi's presentation on that matter, but I do have a public comment that I would like to read. This public comment is from Yadrandra Draskovic. I am commenting on the order made by the Los Angeles County earlier this month to allow in-person instruction for small groups of students with an IEP. While other districts have addressed this issue, El Segundo has not communicated with families at all regarding their plans to implement this. Special needs kids have been suffering since school abruptly closed in March. No one was able to predict this, and it was a necessary course of action. However, we now have more information regarding the virus. In addition, El Segundo has such a low number of cases. I am asking for the board to make this a priority. Special ed students make up a very small number of the student body. Perhaps by bringing in the small group of students, 
ESUSD can start testing the safety of your overall goal, bringing students back to school. Thank you, Yadrandra Draskovich. Thank you for your comments. Um, <clears throat> may I have a motion to approve item B? Moved by Paulette Caldell and seconded by Nancy Cobb. Any discussion on this item? I think we had uh, sufficient discussion during the presentation and I think everybody knows that we want to move in this direction. So, uh, Benny, I'll ask for your advisory vote. Aye. And uh, Tracy? Aye. Emily? Aye. Nancy? Aye. Paulette? Aye. Aye from me. So, five out to approve the limited specialized support services on campus and Hopefully it'll be expeditious. We all want that. Next, we have item C, approval of learning continuity and attendance plan. Uh, Dr. Moore? Yes, at our last board meeting, Marisa Janicek, Assistant Superintendent of Educational Services, shared a presentation to the board regarding the learning continuity and attendance plan. Uh, this is what uh, the state is requiring in lieu of a local control accountability plan during this time of remote learning. So this will be uh, what will take us through this school year. And then uh, we obviously all hope to shift back to uh, working with LCAPs in the future. So I recommend approval. All right, um, motion to approve. Moved by Tracy Miller-Zarnicki, seconded by Nancy Cobb. Any questions or discussion on this item? I just want to say thank you to the team that put that document together because it was huge and so full of detail. So thank you to all the hard work of the committees and, and staff that put that together. Great, thank you. Um, Benny, your advisory vote? Aye. And Tracy? Aye. Emily? Aye. Nancy? Aye. Paulette? Aye. And I vote aye, so 5 0 to approve item C. Moving on to item D, approval of resolution 7 for 2020 2021, rescinding the elimination of classified services. Dr. Moore. Yes, uh, I enthusiastically bring this item to the board this evening along with Dr. Dylan Ferris and really our whole administrative team. Um, it was with a heavy heart that on August 4th, we had to bring a resolution to the board regarding um, elimination of classified service and consideration of having to lay employees off and provide them a 60 day notice. Um, during this distance learning time, we have worked diligently to have our employees involved in purposeful work. Um, obviously, being the first time that we've been in this situation, as a public education institution, we were not clear as to what work would be available for each position. So I'm very pleased that Dr. Ferris, along with our entire administrative team, worked really tirelessly in cooperation with our CSEA um, leadership and our labor representative to find a way. And so we bring tonight elimination um, that we're able to rescind layoff notices for a significant number of our employees. So it's a, with a great deal of enthusiasm that I recommend approval this evening. And Dr. Ferris and I are available if you have further question. Thank you. So uh, motion to approve this resolution made by Paulette Cardell and seconded by Nancy Cobb. Discussion, comments. I just want to say we are so pleased that the district worked so diligently with CSEA to bring this resolution before us. Um, you know, that was difficult in August to pass that resolution for layoffs, and it um, certainly gives me a great deal of pleasure to rescind part of that. Uh, unfortunately, we can't do all, but a significant number. So thank you for that. Yes, Tracy. Yeah, I just want to say that I really appreciate the all the campuses looking at what they needed in their student population to figure out how we could best service everybody and provide the backup that they need, the support that they need. And 
yeah, I feel a little lighter knowing that we are able to keep uh, many of our, our staff with us. So I, I do wish it were everyone, but I appreciate what happened in these last 60 days a lot. So thank you. Yeah, I would just like to add that it's important to know that um, this is really a work in progress. So although we're not able to say with certainty today that we're able to bring back everyone, um, the district continues to monitor what is permissible. So um, we have our first step, which is to provide limited um, specialized services. Um, at our next meeting, we will be bringing an item for the board regarding uh, athletic conditioning. And so with that, uh, that could also include um, an additional position uh, that would need to be reevaluated. Um, so we look to um, possibly offer some type of services for athletes uh, that Dr. Gooden will be presenting at the next meeting. Uh, in addition, I will be presenting on the um, elementary waiver again. And once again, if we have students back on campus in the future, um, likely several, a couple of months from now, uh, that perhaps then we would have need for further staffing. Um, if kids are on a playground, then we need playground supervisors. So um, we will continue to monitor this uh, as we um, work within the parameters uh, put out by public health, but also continue to push what's best for our students here in ESUSD. Thank you. All right, let's go ahead and I'll call for the vote. And Benny, your advisory vote. Aye. Thank you. Tracy? Aye. Aye. Nancy? Aye. Paulette? Aye. Emily? Aye. And I vote aye, so that's 5-0 to approve item D. Next, we're moving into item E, approval of report of annual teaching assignments with approval of teachers to teach under education codes. And I'm not gonna read them all, so <laughs> Dr. Moore. Yes, one of the things that are required each year is uh, credential monitoring and Dr. Ferris uh, works diligently to make sure that teachers are teaching in their appropriately assigned area. Uh, and the report here outlines that based on education code, certain people uh, do need to be authorized by the board to serve in a specific capacity. And so I recommend approval and the report is there for your consideration. Thank you. So, motion to approve. Uh, moved by Tracy Miller Zarnicki, seconded by Nancy Cobb. Any further discussion on this item? Something we've done every year. It's pretty routine. All right, then let's go ahead and uh, vote. Benny, your advisory vote. Aye. Tracy? Aye. Aye. Nancy? Aye. Paulette? Aye. And Emily? Aye. Aye for me. So item E is approved, 5 0. Next, we have the approval of a consultant services agreement with David G. Miller, attorney and independent outside investigator. Uh, Dr. Moore? Yes, we bring this to you to handle an independent investigation for a personnel matter. And this is a not to exceed amount uh, from my understanding, correct? That is correct. Thank you. Uh, so a motion for this item, please. Moved by uh, Tracy miller zarnicki seconded by Paulette Caudell. Any discussion on this consultant agreement? All right, then we'll go ahead with a vote. Benny, your advisory vote. Aye. Emily? Aye. Tracy? Aye. Nancy? Aye. Paulette? Aye. Aye from me. Item F is approved, 5 0. Next, we have item G, approval to enter into a three year service agreement with Siemens Industry Incorporated. Dr. Moore? Uh, yes, this is uh, for heating, ventilation, and air conditioning service agreement. Um, 
I commend Mr. Abihi, who worked very hard on request for proposal and job walk and went through the process. And Siemens came out the winner again. They've they've been with us and uh, they won uh, the work fair and square. So we're excited that uh, we received better pricing by going through this process. All right. Uh, motion to approve. Moved by Emily Lane. Second. Seconded by Tracy Miller Zarnicki. Any discussion or questions? Not then, uh, Benny or advise you vote. Aye. Emily. Aye. Tracy. Aye. Nancy. Aye. Paulette. Aye. And I from me. So item G is approved. Five O. Next, we'll move into our informational calendar. Yes, I would like to share that uh, we appreciate our local PTA units that are sponsoring two candidate forums for uh, individuals running for school board. So our first one is on Thursday, this Thursday, uh, September 24th at 6 p.m. And then a second uh, forum will be on October 15th at 4 30 p.m. and this will be hosted uh, via webex and then uh, our ptas will be posting the video uh, on their particular website following the um uh, when the video is ready uh, in addition we have our next scheduled board meeting on october 13th dr mar how will the um webex link be communicated to the public who may wish to view the candidates form, do you know? Uh, I would defer to Tracy Miller Zarnicki on that. Um, uh, it's all being handled through PTA. I, I have not seen a link as of yet. Yeah, they, um, I believe if, if they haven't posted them already on social media, they will soon. I think the idea is um, making sure that the sign-ins, because it's coming from WebEx, uh, the people who are just watching will not have ability to speak and mm -hmm. just Zoom bomb things. Well, WebEx bomb, whatever. Um, so if the link isn't out there already, it may not be. Um, I, I can't confirm that at the moment, but it will be because the people running these programs are very detail oriented and uh, I'm sure they'll be out there on all kinds of social media. Uh, of time. Will, will the district have a link at all? Because I. There may be people not on social media, at least with with the PTA. Perhaps we can um, have Miss Janicek reach out to um, Miss Smith. Miss Janicek, do you have a link? Or yes, I do. I just wanted to let you know, Mrs. Smith sent me the flyer to send out earlier this week, and we'll be sending out the link in the next couple of days. So we will be coming out via email. Great. Well, there we go. All right. <laughs> Good to know. Thank you. All right, we will move into board members' reports and discussions. So um, we'll go ahead and start with Paulette Caudill. Okay, um, I had a good time for the last two weeks. I was able to attend the uh, Richmond Street PTA uh, and the, um, the back to school night for middle school and the back to school night for high school. And I have to say that, oh, did I do it for the PTA? Okay. And oh, and the middle school, yeah, P, the, their P, um, parent teacher meeting. Anyway, I really enjoyed them. They were very well organized, very well presented. Um, I was really blown away by the quality of the, per, the, the, the Zoom meetings, I guess. <laughs> anyway, and then um, I also wanted to say, um, that uh, road meeting, reach out against drugs. We were able to have our first one since January and it was well attended and we're really excited and I'm looking forward to more meetings and I'm also looking forward to having students there. Um, I don't know, Benny, if you can talk to uh, Ms. Espinosa and see if there's any kids that can come. We'd like to see them. It's been a Busy two weeks. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, let's hear from uh, Nancy Cobb next. Thank you. 
I have been attending the SoCal Rock meetings, and we have had a few extra meetings as well. Um, we will have uh, some complete updates on enrollment at our, our next board meeting. Uh, we did approve a new adult electrical program that will complement the existing program that we have, but will lead to more advanced certifications. So this is uh, excellent news for adults who are pursuing that, but also good news for our students because if they complete the preliminary courses while they're in high school, of course, they'll be able to go on and complete more advanced uh, cert certifications. Uh, I do want to take a moment to thank the people from the community who reached out to us and gave their input. Uh, of course, we've heard a lot of different opinions, but we really do appreciate hearing from you. And as we make our decisions going forward, I just want you to know that uh, for me personally, and I think for the other board members, the first thing that we do is to take a look at our own goals and, and, and our graduate profile. And I think that uh, the first two are really um, important to remember. We want to ensure high quality learning to increase student achievement and develop well-rounded students who are prepared for college and career. And that means all students. And secondly, we want to promote the social and emotional well-being of all students and foster a positive learning environment and culture for all. So we will keep that in mind as we consider all of the community input. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, moving on to Emily Lane. Yeah, I just, um, you know, I want to quickly touch on the bond sale. You know, that, that's exciting news, you know, in this uh, day and age of who knows where the economy is and, and where things are at. You know, it's it's nice to, to secure that bond and to be able to move forward with the various projects we've started and, and where we're headed. So, you know, that's exciting. And again, I thank the community, you know, when you, Drive around El Scando right now. Um, it kind of looks like um, we might be tearing down buildings <laughs> or just completely redoing everything. But that that really is the bond money at work. So thank you, and um, hopefully we can get secure materials uh, and, and get moving on some things. And I hope that's what the community understands. I had someone ask, "What in the world with Richmond?" Because of the boards for so long, and you know, I explained. You know, COVID is is um, is reaching the world in so many different ways, and manufacturing and those types of things are taking a hit. And so, that's where that's at with all the boards. Um, we are just waiting for the windows to show up. Um, I want to thank Tracy for uh, attending the middle school PTSA meeting for me. I was um, out of town on a a job with my husband, and um, I appreciate it's it's crazy times, and we're taking work when we can get work right now. So thank you for stepping in on that. Um, and as Nancy said, you know, I, I really, um, and Paulette alluded to, it's been a busy couple weeks and, and for various, various reasons from, from still the distant learning and keeping up with waivers and just all the things that we're doing. And, um, you know, I just <laughs> really want the community to understand that we hear them. Um, we, will continue to make the best decisions for our students um hearing the community but making the best students right this decision for our students you know uh, education today um it's just extremely complex with what our students or our staff our teachers our administrators are are where we are at to, to deliver an education it's complex it's not um a simple thing anymore um and you know, I thought about all day, all week, what what to say here. And I, I really want to challenge our community um, to be examples. And um, you know, social media, I can't even get on it right now, just to see the divide and to see the name calling and to see the just um, the disrespect that's happening there. I can't get on it, and it's unfortunate that. Um, you know, that we are the adults and we need to be setting examples for our students and our students are watching and they're listening and they need examples. Um, no one is perfect. We all have uh, different experiences. We all have different perspectives and we need to have teaching moments and maybe just um, a little more understanding of all sides 
so that we can get to the right place. And I just really, I, I think there was only about 40 people listening right now, but I, I hope it gets out to more to just please stop with the name calling and the accusations, you know, um, I, no, we're not going to get anywhere and it's not a good example for our students. So, um, yeah, again, as, as Nancy said, we are here, we are, we are listening. We, um, but we need to be constructive and thoughtful in, in how we move forward. Thanks. Thank you. Tracy. Yeah, um, so yeah, it has been a busy couple of weeks. Uh, I'm gonna start in the world of PTA to say I enjoyed attending the middle school uh, first meeting of the year. Good job, Ms. Smith and your team there. Um, I was happy to wear the parent and the board member hat in that meeting, got a two for one deal doing that. Um, I also attended the uh, PTA council meeting last night and it is awesome to hear how our campuses are shifting their PTA support to follow our current mode of schooling. So thank you all, all of you out there in, in your efforts to be flexible and do whatever needs to be done to help support our staff and students at this time. Um, I was uh, happy to attend back to school night for the high school as a parent and had no technical glitches. Uh, although now I have a technical glitch in that because I had to sign in as my high school son, my professional Zoom meetings keep coming up as Josh with an in and out logo as like the placeholder. So I gotta I gotta figure out how to reset that. Um, and uh, the other thing that I think has been fascinating is is to be in on some of the LA County Department of Public Health calls. Uh, we are permitted to enter some of those, and they're like every other week. And it's fascinating to hear all the angles and the data that they're taking into account as they evaluate where we're at. And um, the last call I was on, there was actually um, good progress, I think. It was exciting to hear that the number of cases per 100,000 was dropping at a notable level. So I hope that stays on course and that we can open things, more things back up sooner rather than later. So that was good. I hope we stay in that path. Um, and lastly, yeah, so there's been a lot of conversation around town in these last two weeks about some pretty hot topics. And since we just sent a joint communication in this arena last night, I don't need to belabor our position on that here, but I will say that I hope that the continued dialogue that we invite can be respectful, constructive, and collaborative, and can come from a place of fact-based discussion and not mere perpetuation of propaganda talking points. Uh, this is the kind of responsible role modeling that we should be setting, like Emily said, for our students. We need to set this example, and it's again, you know, what we embrace and outline in our graduate profile and our core values. So let's all adults do that, please. And um, again, I just want to say thank you to all of you that support the efforts to create a more positive environment for all of our students, staff, and communities so that we can do the best work we can here together and then branch that out to benefit the greater world. That's it for now. Thank you. Yeah, uh, it's been, um, you know, I think um, in many ways a difficult couple of weeks. Um, it, it's good that we have such an engaged community and they have uh, certainly peppered us with emails and we all appreciate hearing from our constituents because we are responsive to you, our community. But um, you know what I feel very good about is that we've had the opportunity to meet with some members of the community. We have uh, other meetings scheduled, and um, you know I appreciate that people want to discuss the issues that are most concerned to them. And uh, right now it's social justice issues, but it's also online learning and those kinds of issues. And um, it, it's always nice when you get an email and embedded in it, they talk about their experience with the school and how distance learning is going. And for the most part, there's high praise for the way kids have been educated and how distance learning is going. So, you know, we really appreciate uh, the efforts of our teachers and our staff to make it as positive an experience as possible. Uh, we know at the lower grades it's difficult and so we're looking to hopefully bring younger kids back when we can safely do so. But um, 
please continue to communicate. Let us know what's important to you and if we can meet with you personally to have further discussions, we welcome that opportunity. And um, uh, hopefully we'll get um, everybody's input and come up with, I, I think, a way to proceed that's in the best interests of our students, because that's what we're all here for. We want to make sure our students are educated and have the greatest learning opportunity possible while they're also going to Unified School District. And that's certainly the board's intent as well. So thank you for letting us know how we might better do our job. And Dr. Moore, I'll turn it over to you. You're muted. Uh, I, I too um, share the board's collective commitment behind our district's actions in our goals for our future and our graduate profile. Um, our commitment is really to providing our students a learning environment that is welcome and safe and all our students can thrive. And now is really the time that we need to come together and listen with open hearts and minds that we can collaboratively forge a pathway so that we can see this for all kids. And I believe that, I truly believe that as a champion for children. We look forward to continuing the conversation. And along those lines, I have some good news to share that our County Office of Education this summer put out a call for uh, kind of an elite group of students uh, to come together on re in, to be an advisory council to our um, County Office of Education. And um, Dr. Gooden and her team nominated uh, uh, two to three students for that. And Little El Segundo High School was selected. And let me share a little bit about the student. So congratulations to Jayla Perry. Jayla is a senior. She is the president of the Black Student Union and a member of the Biomedical Pathway at the high school. She runs track and field, and she also participates in the Student Equity Advisory Committee. So this is quite an honor because it's a very select group of kids. So for our little district of 3,500 kids to have a student at the county level is truly amazing. So I congratulate Jayla and her parents. I congratulate Dr. Gooden and her team. And I think it just once again reinforces the really high quality students that we are producing here in our district. And our promise is the graduate profile. And Jayla is definitely a student that um, embodies those characteristics. So. I think that's a good way to end the meeting on a positive note. Thank you, everyone. Yes, that's fantastic news. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Uh, we have no closing remarks from the audience and we will not be recessing the closed session, which means at 6.13, I am going to adjourn this meeting. And thank you all for participating. All right, bye-bye.